Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to C4C Apologetics. So what this video is, this is actually a two-part video over something that I'm teaching on here at the church. Specifically, we want to look at the book of John. The book of John, chapter 1, verse number 1. So we're going to look at John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. We want to look at this verse and see how a couple different other religions or false religions, dare I say cults, interpret, translate, and understand this verse. And we want to see from their interpretation or understanding, is there credence, is there legitimacy to their view of this verse, or is there something else behind? And so that's exactly what we're doing. So I have some slides here. We're going to be talking about a little bit of these slides. And today we're specifically looking at John 1 and the Mormons. And so I have uh, the Book of Mormon. I have a few of these, actually. I used to have the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearly Great Price, but I believe I gave them away or let somebody else use them, borrow them. I have a bunch of notes written in here as far as things that are uh, contradictory to the actual scripture itself. And so today's video is talking about the Mormon church, the ODS church. Now, what we're talking about isn't going to be found in the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon doesn't cover John chapter 1 or any of the King James version of the Bible. This is just really just, you know, a placeholder. Hey, look, you know, this is what we're talking about. I don't know. I just show you my Book of Mormon. I don't know. But uh, so anyways, that's what we're jumping into. Before we actually get into John 1, realize some of the obscure teachings that's found within the LDS religion. And a lot of times, even the Mormons don't even realize that the LDS Church, in their own writings, teach this stuff. For instance, they teach exaltation, which is just like these Far East uh, ideas of man gaining enlightenment, gaining this perfection. And more specifically, Lorenzo Snow, who is the fifth LDS president, says, As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. And so what they're teaching here is the fact that as you and I are, God, Jehovah, Yahweh, was just like us, flesh and blood, bones, had a will, uh, just he was a person. And then this individual received exaltation, they lived perfectly, and they were able to become a God, uh, if you will, with their celestial wife and have spirit children. And then we are the offspring of the spirit children. Now, this isn't something that President Snow just created himself, being the fifth president. Matter of fact, this is something that Joseph Smith Jr. actually taught also. In a sermon that he had given out back in the 1840s, he said, God himself was once as we are now, and is an exalted man, and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. It is the first principle of the gospel. There's another book out there that the Mormons believe in. They, uh, they, uh, it's more of like a doctrinal book, if you will. It's called The Gospel Principles. And I'd recommend if you want to look more into this false religion that has a lot of the basic doctrines within Mormonism. It says it's the first principle of the gospel to know for certainty that the character of God and to know that we may converse with him as one man converses with another and that he was once a man like us, yea, that God himself, the father of us all, was once a man like us and dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ did. So again, this is coming straight out of the mouth of Joseph Smith Jr. saying that pretty much like Lorenzo Snow said, as man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. And so they teach this view of exaltation. Something else that they teach is the fact that God, Jehovah, resides in a location nearest to a particular star called Kolob. And we read this in the book of Abraham. Now, the book of Abraham is found in the book called The Pearl of Great Price, which is not in this. The Pearl of Great Price is actually a separate uh, separate book. They have a couple books of Abraham, book of Moses, some other writings, things like that. And in the book of Abraham, chapter 3, it says, And I saw the stars that they were very great, and that one of them was nearest unto the throne of God. And there were many great ones which were near unto it. And the Lord said unto me, These are the governing ones. And the name of the great one is Kolob. 
because it is near unto me. For I am the Lord thy God, I have set this one to govern all those which belong to the same order as that upon which thou standest. And so the ODS Church teaches that if you want to find the location of God, God resides in a planet or in a location that is nearest to the star Kolob. And they also have a song that they sing. It's when one of their hymnals called, If We Could High or Fly or Go to Kolob. Some other teachings they have is temple garments. So a, uh, I, I'm not going to say a legit Mormon, but a Mormon that went through all the temple endowment ceremonies, celestial marriages, things like that, they can actually receive these garments and wear them every day. From the Church of Jesus Christ website, it says endowment members receive a simple undergarment, often referred to as the temple garment or garment of the priesthood. Unlike other ceremonial clothing used during the endowment, the garment is worn underneath members' normal clothes for the rest of their lives, serving as a daily physical reminder of their covenant relationship with God. And so your very strict, very devout Muslims who's been through the temple endowment ceremony with Melchizedek, Aaronic priesthood, celestial marriages, things like that, they have these temple undergarments and they're wearing them underneath their regular clothes. Just some obscure teachings. But today in this video, what we're actually looking at is John chapter 1, verse number 1. What does the Mormon church teach about this particular verse? And as you can see on the screen, that image is a common image you'd see on top of all the LDS temples. And it's an image of the angel Moroni blowing a trumpet. And so this is an angel that they believe uh, helped Joseph Smith find the plates, the golden plates, to go ahead and translate and decipher the Book of Mormon from re Reformed Egyptian. And so what do the Mormons teach about John 1.1? 1, 1? Well, first, this is going to be the most important question. I don't believe the most important question is, do you believe God? Do you believe there is a God? Because that doesn't get you to Christ, to eternal life. The most important question is, who is Jesus Christ? We're all probably very familiar with mere Christianity and C.S. Lewis. And a lot of times people attribute the phrase, uh, Jesus Christ is either liar, lunatic, or Lord to C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. But he didn't come up with this idea. He didn't come up with this trilemma, liar, lunatic, or Lord. Watchman Nee, who was a Christian uh, evangelist preacher over in China, in his book, The Normal Christian Life, says this. First, in regards to Jesus, if he claims to be God and yet in fact is not, he has to be a madman or a lunatic. Second, if he is neither God or a lunatic, he has to be a liar, deceiving others by his lie. Third, if neither of these, he must be God. You can only choose one of the three possibilities. If you do not believe that he is God, you have to consider him as a madman. If you cannot take him for either of the two, you have to take him for a liar. There is no need for us to prove if Jesus of Nazareth is God or not. All we have to do is find out if he is a lunatic or a liar. If he is neither, he must be the Son of God. And so this is what Watchman Nee had written. But even before his time, there is a Scottish preacher by the name of John Duncan who has said in one of his sermons, Christ either deceived mankind by conscious fraud or he himself was deluded or self-deceived, or he was divine. There is no getting out of this trilemma. It is inexplorable. So again, liar, lunatic, or lord, this is going to be the most important question that anybody will ask themselves in their entire life. Who is Jesus? And that's why John chapter 1, verse number 1 is so pivotal because in the next video, the other video, we're going to be talking about the Jehovah Witnesses and how they look at John 1.1 1, 1, and they pull away the divinity and the deity of Jesus out of that verse. It's interesting because in the very opening of the book of Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the Bible does not try to defend itself, does not try to explain itself. The Bible does not try to explain God. It starts at that presupposition. And in the very beginning of the Gospel of John, it is very similar. John does not seek to just argue the truth of God, the truth of Jesus' divinity. 
he simply says it is the truth. And so it's quite fascinating when you compare the beginning of John and the beginning of Genesis, both the beginnings, if you will. So who did Jesus think he was? A lot of people claim Jesus never said he was God. He never claimed to be God. He never claimed divinity. But these people are really kind of just ignorant, and I don't mean it in a nasty, mean way, but ignorant, uh, uneducated about what Jesus' ministry was, the uh, the reasons behind his crucifixion and what some of the things he did and he said was in John chapter 8 verse 58 Jesus says clear as day before Abraham was I am and he's referencing the I am the ego in me uh, back from Genesis chapter uh, Genesis chapter Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 my bad Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 with Moses at the burning bush when Moses says who will I tell the Israelites to send me and God says I am that I am sent you, and that is the ego of me in the actual Greek, and it's the same word that Jesus uses to claim divinity. Not only that, in John chapter 10, verse 33, in 10 verses 30 through 33, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones to stone him. The Jews wanted to kill Jesus because he said, I and my Father are one. And Jesus says, for which of the works are you stoning me? And what do they say? For a good work we stone you not, but for blasphemy. Because that you, being a man, makes thyself out to be God. And so the Jews are trying to kill Jesus because to the Jews who knew uh, the Old Testament, who knew the Hebrew and the Greek, and they knew the theology, they knew Jesus was claiming to be God and that's why they were wanting to kill him. Then in John chapter 20 at the end of the Gospel of John we see when Jesus has a post-resurrection appearance to Thomas. And What does Thomas say? He says my Lord my God. What does Jesus say? No Thomas I'm not God. No. Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Matter of fact Jesus says because you have seen me you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. Jesus does not rebuke or condemn Thomas for calling him God. It's quite fascinating because when you read in Scripture and you see any prophets or anybody coming into the presence of an angel and they fall down and they think they're in presence of God, they say, no, stop, get up, don't worship me, I'm just merely a servant and messenger. But yet here Jesus does not do that. Jesus receives not only the worship but the title of Thomas calling him God. Jesus claimed divinity. The Jews of the day knew he was claiming divinity and messiahship, and so that is a clear case within the Gospels. So who is Jesus? Well, in this day and age, it's fascinating. When you look at all the world religions, every major world religion knows about Jesus. Now, they teach that Jesus is something different in each major world religion, but every major world religion believes in a historical Jesus. You can see here that in Islam they believe he's the 24th prophet that actually prophesied the coming of Muhammad being the paraclete. In Hinduism they believe that Jesus is, I believe, the reincarnation of a god they believe in, god of Vishnu. In Buddhism he's a teacher that teaches how to reach nirvana or this enlightenment stage. The Jehovah Witness, he's Michael the Archangel. In Mormonism they teach Jesus that is a the spirit brother of Lucifer, and in essence, our elder brother as well, because Jesus was a created being. And then in Christianity, the true religion, and according to John 1 1, and elsewhere, it clearly teaches that Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us, God in flesh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among men, that Jesus Christ is none other uh, than the second person of the Trinity. And so, depending on what major world religion you're looking at, they each believe in a historical Jesus. And that's fascinating. That's fascinating in and of itself. So many people ask the question, well, if, if God is, uh, want to be clear, and there's all this evidence for Jesus, why would God make it confusing if everybody says that all paths lead to God? Is it the Muslim path? Is it the Christian path? Is it the Buddhist path? How do we get to God? And if it's all ways, well, isn't that confusing? Because they all teach that Jesus is something else. And with that, I would just bring up the law of non-contradiction. 
that two opposing views cannot be equally true at the same time. Either Jesus is God or he is not God. As Watchman Nee and uh, John Duncan had said, we don't necessarily have to figure out whether he was a liar or a lunatic. We just have to figure out if he is God. And the other religions, they do not believe that Jesus is God. So either A, all the other religions are wrong, and Christianity is true, or B, all of the other religions are wrong to include Christianity, or C, Christianity is wrong and one of the other religions is true because they all teach something different about Jesus. And I would argue and I would posit and I would stake everything on that Christianity is the truth, that Jesus is who he said he was, and by his death, burial, and resurrection proved him to be the Messiah, the Passover, the Lamb who comes to take away the sins of the world, and that he is God in flesh, God with us, Emmanuel. But what are we talking about today? Like I said, today we're looking at how do the Mormons interpret John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. You see, for this, we have to go ahead and get outside of the Book of Mormon, outside of the Doctrine and Covenants, outside of the Pearl of Great Price, and we have to look at either A, the Gospel Principles for Mormonism, which I don't have a copy of the book with me anymore, or B, the King James Version translation of their scripture. In one of the articles of the faith that they have, which you can find, I believe it's in the back of the Pearl of Great Price, or maybe it's in the back of the Complete Book of Mormon. I think the Mormon books, the Book of Mormon that you get at like the Marriott, these aren't the Complete Book of Mormon because it's missing uh, the Joseph Smith history, it's missing the Articles of Faith and stuff like that. But in the 8th verse, I believe it is, in the Article of Faith, it says this, We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. And so what they teach is that the Bible, this book right here, the King James Version, is actually the Word of God as long as it's translated correctly. And who is it translated correctly by? None other than Joseph Smith, according to them, because he is their first prophet. David Seeley from the book Things Restored, and Seeley is a longtime uh, LDS member, he said as far as the Joseph Smith translation, which is what they use, the King James Version Bible, but the translation made by Joseph Smith, he says that the prophet Joseph Smith did not translate the Bible in the traditional sense of the word to go back to the Hebrew and the Greek and make it into English. Rather, he went through the biblical text of the King James and made inspired corrections, revisions, and additions to the biblical text. And so the Joseph Smith translation, which is where you can get the King James Version Bible and what the Joseph Smith teach about these verses, you can get that and see that these are what they believe are the prophet's inspired writings. And now it's interesting because only two of these are actually canonized and they're canonized books the others are not so you'll have the book of Moses as well as the book of Matthew and I think it's mainly Matthew chapter 24 and the Olivet Discourse that are actually canonized and believed by the official church that these are legitimate revelations and inspirations by God the others they will more likely teach that these are just biblical commentary these are just commentaries from Joseph Smith being a student of the word and trying to exegete scripture in that he used some commentators of the day, uh, in his day, contemporary to him. And so, that's quite interesting as well. It's also said, according to LDS.org, that the Joseph Smith translation, to some extent, assists in the restoring the plain and precious things that have been lost from the Bible. Because again, remember, after the death of the last apostle, they believed that the church would apostate, that all the true teachings left the church, fell away. There were no true Christians until, I believe it was Moroni, went to visit Joseph Smith in New, New York, Manchester, New York, to dig up the plates years later, and yada, yada, yada. And so for that almost 1,800 year period or more, that there was no true church, no true Christian teaching, and that the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible restores what was supposed to be there from the beginning. There's a lot of problems with that view. I'm not going to take time in here to, to look at that and to explain and expound upon it. But even if you were to look at the church father 
uh, the histories and their commentaries from a Cantina Bible app, which is a fascinating app I'd recommend you get. All the commentaries and all the writings from early church fathers line up with the epistles and the letters we have in the Bible. And so even the church fathers of the first, second, third centuries still held true to a lot of the biblical faith and biblical tenets and teachings, things like that. So I don't really know where they're going with this one as far as the great apostasy is concerned, but maybe I'll do another video later on that. Let's see. There are over 3,400 inspired changes, additions, and revisions to the King James Version translation of the Bible made by Joseph Smith. So 3,400. And so I looked at this earlier, and, and if you were to look at each revision was a verse, one verse, so you're looking at over 3,400 verses, out of the fact that the Bible is said to have about 31,102 verses, that means that Joseph Smith would have revised 11%, more than a tenth of the Bible, for his teaching, his theology, his inspiration, if you will. That's a lot of changes. So, jumping right into it. John 1.1. 1, 1. This is what the King James Version says. In the beginning was the Word. Word was with God. The Word was God. What does Joseph Smith translation say? Again, this isn't necessarily the canonized because it's the book of John, not Matthew or Moses. But this is what they teach is to be true understanding of this verse. In the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son. And the gospel was the Word, and the Word was with the Son. And the Son was with God, and the Son was of God. Now, there's a lot here. There's a lot written into this verse. And so you can see right off the bat how much different this verse is from the original from the King James. In the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son. The gospel was preached through the Son, and the gospel was the Word. And the Word was with the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was of God. So, some things to focus on and pay attention to. Here it says, the gospel was preached through the Son, Jesus. The gospel was the Word. And the Word was with the Son, Jesus. But let's look at this. If the gospel is preached through Jesus, and the gospel is the Word, and the Word is with the Son, there's some problems with that. There's some problems with that. Because when we're looking at this, we can tell right here that the Gospel was preached through the Son and the Gospel was the Word. So what they're saying is Jesus preached the Gospel. I'll agree with that. Jesus definitely preached the Gospel. And it says Jesus preached the Gospel was the Word. So Jesus preached the Word. I would agree that Jesus preached the Word, not based off this verse, but that he did. And then it says, the Word was with the Son. And so this means that the Word is distinct from the Son. The Word is distinct from Jesus. Now going back to the original King James Version translation, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now we would argue that the Word is another name, the Logos, or the Memra in Aramaic, I believe it is, is actually Jesus Christ. Because we'll see that later in verse 14 where the Word became flesh. So there's some uniquenesses in this verse that the Joseph Smith translation brings out. Namely that the gospel, which is the Word in John 1, is complete distinct from Jesus. They are separate. They are two distinct things. One is a message and one is a person. But let's look at some other verses within that same context, within the same chapter. In John 1.14, the Joseph Smith translation says, And the same word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so remember, the gospel is preached through the Son. The gospel is the word, and the word is with the Son. Remember, the Word and Jesus are distinct and separate. But here in verse 14, they make an oops. They make an oopsie. Because they say the Word was made flesh and the Word dwelt among us or among people, among men. 
And so if the word is just a message, how can the message take on flesh and blood? Here they're equating the word with Jesus Christ, which I would agree. In the beginning of this word, word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among men. And we beheld his glory. And that's what the King James, that's what God's word actually says. But their John 1.1 1, 1 is distinct from John 1.15, and it doesn't align up, even within the own context of their own translation. Because they've already identified that the word is the gospel and the gospel is with, distinct from Jesus. But now they're saying that the word became flesh. We know that Jesus became flesh at the incarnation, not the word. So here there's a logical contradiction in their th in their uh, teaching then in John 1 16 for in the beginning was the word even the son who was made flesh and sent unto us by the will of the father again this is another inconsistency even when in the first 16 verses of the book of John how they're trying to push their ideology push their theology but they can't get their verses to line up without being contradictory because here Remember, in the beginning was the Word. What was the Word? The Word is the Gospel, the Gospel that was distinct from Jesus. And it says, in the beginning was the Word, even the Son who is made flesh. And so here in proper English grammar, uh, grammatical rules, this sentence would pretty much say, in the beginning was the Word who is made flesh. And so that uh, parenthetical statement, even the Son, which really is tying into the fact that the Son is the Word, the parenthetical statement could be taken out in that sentence. That thought would still remain fine. In the beginning was the Word who was made flesh and sent to us by the will of the Father. So again, there's inconsistencies in their theology in this very first chapter. If the Gospel is the Word then the gospel cannot take on flesh. It's like if I say the word uh, duffel bag. The word duffel bag is not going to take on flesh. The word duffel bag is just a word. It's just abstract. You hear it. It's a concept. It paints a picture in your mind. But it will never take on flesh and dwell among you or I. Christ has done that not the gospel, which is what they're trying to teach, and it makes no sense whatsoever. So in John 1, 1, the word is the gospel and was preached through the Son. However, in verse 14, the word becomes dwell, uh, flesh and dwells among men. Like I said, verse 14 contradicts verse 1 in the Joseph Smith translation in a couple ways. If the word is the gospel that Jesus preached, how in the world does the word become flesh and take on flesh and blood? Then, when we're reading in verse 14, it adds the pronoun he to the gospel. It adds the pronoun he to the gospel, all all alluding to the fact that the gospel, the word, is actually Jesus. Again, contradicting John 1.1 1, 1 in their translation, but what I would agree, the word is Jesus. And then in verse 16, it contradicts verse 1 in the Joseph Smith translation as well, where again, the word is the gospel and is with the Son completely distinct again. Then how can the gospel become flesh? How can the gospel, how can a word take on flesh? And then again, like I said, that parenthetical statement, even the Son, the word is named in verse 16 as God as Jesus right there. And so there's logical contradictions within their own verses. So the ODS claims inspired revisions to the King James Version translation. Now, this is something that, uh, as you're going to see with the Jehovah Witness, if you check out that video uh, regarding how they look at John 1 1, you'll be able to look at that and say, yeah, they, they totally butchered it. They totally uh, don't understand Greek whatsoever. But here with the Mormons, no matter how much you can show them grammatically and historically, whatever the case is, that this is what it should be, they can always say, nope, God gave the inspiration to Joseph Smith. 
and we trust Joseph Smith received this inspiration, and it is legitimate, it is factual, it is truthful. We're not going to be able to get around that to prove it because it's based on their subjective experience and their subjective presuppositions of trusting, not in the Book of Mormon or in the validation of it, but in Joseph Smith Jr. himself. That's why at LDS Church, they really don't follow a religion. They follow a person, namely that of Joseph Smith Jr. And so that's pretty much it for this video. So I just thanks for checking in. Like I said, hop over there to the other video. Listen to the Jehovah Witness one. How do they break down John 1.1? 1, 1. Is the word a God or is the word God? There's a difference. There's a huge difference. And a lot of it has to do with the Greek definite or indefinite article. And we'll look at that later. So again, thanks for checking it out. Hit me up in comments in the, in the below section. Let me know right, wrong, indifferent, what you thought, uh, critiques, whatever the case is. And if you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button so that you stay abreast as far as any new videos that come up. And especially when we do start going live. So thanks for watching. God bless.